Today we begin reading the Geoffrey Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales, beginning with the general prologue. In the general prologue, uh, Geoffrey Chaucer will introduce all the characters who are going to be in his story. <clears throat> Juan that April, we at the shortest suit, the drought march hath pursed to the root, and bathed every vein in sweet liqueur, of which virtue engendered is the fleur. Juan Zephyrus eke with his sweet breath, in speeded hath in every halt and heath, the tandra cropes and the young sonne hath in the ram his half cores erone, and small fowles making melody that slappen all the nacht with open gear. So pricketh him nature in his corsages. corages. All right, don't worry, I'm just playing a joke on you guys. I'm not going to read the whole thing like this. This is called Middle English. Like, it would be kind of a headache to read all of the Canterbury Tales, because it's hundreds of pages, in Middle English. Um, but you will notice that it, it does look a lot closer to modern English than Old English. Remember, when I showed you all Old English in Beowulf, like, it was unrecognizable. Well, here we have lots of words that look very similar. We know what April is. We know what a shower is. We know what a drought is. Like the spellings are a little bit different. They add some syllables to the end of the words like root and power are rute and where's, do they have the word power? They don't even have the word power. Anyway. Um, but you'll notice that um, we're going to, well, you don't need, there's lots of similarities. And we're going to be reading a translation. The translation is going to be much easier to read, but it's still a poem. And so it's going to rhyme all the way through. And it's going to, the language is going to be a little bit different than what you're used to. But I'm here to help. So we can get through this. All right, let's take it from the top. When April with his showers sweet with fruit, the drought of March has pierced unto the root, and bathed each vein with liquor that has such power to generate therein and sire the flower. When Zephyr also has with his sweet breath quickened again in every holt and heath, the tender shoots and buds, and the young sun into the ram one half his course hath run, and many little birds make melody that sleep through all the night with open eye, so nature pricks them on to ramp and rage. Then do folk long to go on pilgrimage, and palmers to go seeking out strange strands to distant shrines well known in sundry lands, and especially from every shire's end of England they to Canterbury wind, the holy blessed martyr there to seek who helped them when they lay so ill and weak. Okay, this is not so hard to understand if you think about it, because he's saying when it when April comes and the rain comes and the snow melts and the the ram is referring to the sign of Aries, which means late March, early April, that's springtime. The little birds start to sing again. Um, Think about it. These people have been living in England. The winters are nasty and cold and snowy. So when the spring comes, people want to go on road trips. They want to. So basically, the story is about spring break. A lot of people are going to travel to a distant shrine in Canterbury. Um, that's why they're pilgrims. Pilgrims are people who travel for religious purposes. And they are going to travel to a church in Canterbury that is dedicated to St. Thomas Becket. Thomas Becket was an archbishop of Canterbury before one of the kings of England killed him. All right, continuing on. 
befell that in that season on a day in Southwark at the tabard as I lay ready to start upon my pilgrimage to Canterbury full of devout homage, there came at nightfall to that hostelry some nine and twenty in a company of sundry persons who had chanced to fall in fellowship, and the pilgrims were they all that toward Canterbury town would ride, the rooms and stables spacious were and wide, and well we well we there were eased and of the best, and briefly, when the sun had gone to rest, so I had to spoke spoken with them every one that I was on their fellowship anon, and made agreement that we'd early rise to take the road as you I will apprise. Okay, so what he's saying is these pilgrims are all going to meet in a lower part of London called Southwark at an inn called the Tabard Inn. All right, there they gather before the road trip and they decide that they're going to travel together because there's safety in numbers. And notice he uses the word I. Geoffrey Chaucer is telling the story, but he's also a character in the story. He is one of the pilgrims. He will be traveling with this company of 29 people. So him plus 29 is 30 people. And uh, they're going to spend the night at the Tabard Inn, and then the next morning they're all going to ride together to Canterbury. But nonetheless, whilst I have time and space before yet farther in this tale I pace, it seems to me accordant with reason to inform you of the state of every one of all of these, as it appeared to me, and who they were, and what was their degree, and even how arrayed there at the inn, and with a night thus will I first begin. So he's going to tell us a description of all 29 of the pilgrims who will go to Canterbury with them, and he's going to start by describing a knight. Uh, we don't get a lot of names of these pilgrims. Most of them are known by their employment or by their, their titles. Uh, so the knight is where we will begin. Actually, 29 pilgrims plus one is a lot of people. And he's just going to list them in, in no apparent order. But we need some kind of way to keep track of them. Some are more important than others. And, uh, but we won't know which ones are important until we read the story. So I'm going to insert a table. First, I'm going to open a Word document, and I'm going to insert a table. And we're going to make a table that is three columns in two rows. And the first column, I want you to put, um, let's put military. In the second column, I want you to put clergy. And then in the third column, there's, we're just going to call it middle class, but really they're secular. They're not clergy and they're not military. All right. And as we read, we're going to keep track of these guys. Now, the first character is a knight. So we know he's military. Um, and we're, after we read his description, we'll come back and write a couple of notes. Okay, a knight there was, and he a worthy man, who from the moment that he first began to ride about the world loved chivalry, truth, honor, freedom, and all courtesy in his liege lord's war, and therein had he ridden none more far, as well in Christendom as heatheness, and honored everywhere for worthiness. At Alexandria he, when it was won, full off the table rosters he'd begun, above all nations, knights in Prussia, in Latvia raided he and Russia. No christened man so oft of his degree, in far Granada at the siege was he, of Algeciras and in Belmarie, at Ias was he, and at Satali. When they were one, and on the middle sea, at many a noble meeting chanced to be, of mortal battles he had fought fifteen. He'd fought for our 
faith at Tramacene, three times in lists and each time slain his foe, this selfsame worthy knight had been also at one time with the Lord of Palati against another heathen in Turkey, and always won he sovereign fame for prize, though so illustrious he was very wise, and bore himself as meekly as a maid, he never yet had any vileness said. In all his life, so whatever, whatsoever white, he was a truly perfect gentle knight. But now to tell you all of his array, his steeds were good, but yet he was not gay. Of simple fustian wore he a jupon, sadly discolored by his harbergeon. For he had lately come from his voyage, and now was going on this pilgrimage. Okay, so this knight is well-traveled. He's been all over Europe and the Middle East, fighting for his lord or his king. Uh, they're probably, because they mentioned Christendom versus the heathens, he probably was participating in the um, Crusades. Um, so he had won many battles, and he's a good knight. And like any good knight, well, this particular good knight was meek. That means he didn't wear fancy clothes, even though he was rich. He wore a dirty old uh, tunic that was worn out from his harbor drum. Um, and he's actually just returned to England recently, and that's why he wants to go to the th shrine of Thomas Beckett to pray for a safe delivery from, you know, all his travels. So let's go to our notes. Okay, with the knight was the squire. With him there was his son, a youthful squire, a lover and a lusty bachelor, with locks well curled as if they'd laid in press. Some twenty years of age he was, I guess. In stature he was of an average length, wondrously active, ire, eye, and great of strength. He'd ridden some time with the cavalry in Flanders, in Artois, and Picardy, and borne him well within that little space, and hoped to win thereby his lady's grace. Prinked out he was, as if he were a mead, all full of fresh-cut flowers, white and red. Singing he was, or fluting all the day. He was, a, he was as fresh as is the month of May. Short was his gown, with sleeves long and wide. Well could he sit on horse and fairly ride. He could make songs and words thereto indite, joust and dance too, as well as sketch and write. So hot he loved that, while night told her tale, he slept no more than does a nightingale. Courteous he and humble, willing and able, and carved before his father at the table. Okay, what do you need to know about the squire? He is lusty. Um, that's why he wears a, a short shirt, so he can show the ladies his uh, pants area. Um, he stays up late at night making love to his ladies, but he's also a military man. He can joust, but he can also play music. He plays the flute, and he can dance. So he's quite the Renaissance man. He can do it all. He's educated. He's trained. He's strong. Uh, the girls would be very impressed by how handsome and muscular and talented he is. So let's take some notes. Okay, we'll put the knight under, I mean the squire, under military. Because basically he is a knight in training. He is a romantic um, youthful, um, talented soldier. We don't need the period because we're not writing sentences. Now to the yeoman. A yeoman had he, nor more servants know at that time, for he chose to travel so. And he was clad in coat and hood of green and sheath, sheaf of peacock, arrows bright and keen under his belt he bore right carefully well could he keep his tackle yeomanly 
His arrows had no draggled feathers low, and in his hand he bore a mighty bow. A cropped head had he, and a sun-browned face. Of woodcraft knew he was he all the useful ways. Upon his arm he bore a bracer gay, and at one side a sword and buckler, yea, and at the other side a dagger bright, well sheathed and sharpest spear point in light. On breast of Christopher of silver sheen, he bore a horn in baldric olive green. A forester he truly was, I guess. Okay, so the yeoman's kind of like a ranger. He's accompanying the knight and the squire, and he's very heavily equipped with bow and arrow. So he would look kind of like Robin Hood, or he would be kind of like Aragorn from the Return of the King before he becomes a king. Um, so he's a military man. All right, so we have a yeoman. He's a forester. He's like a forest ranger. With lots of equipment. Now he, now the knight is going to tell a tale, and the squire is going to tell a tale, but the yeoman never gets a turn to tell the tale. Uh, but we need to be familiar with them anyway. Okay, the next pilgrim. There was also a nun, a prioress, who, in her smiling modest, was and coy. Her greatest oath was but by St. Alloy. And she was known as Madame Eglantine. Full well she sang the services divine, intoning through her nose becomingly, and fair she spoke her French and fluently. After the school of Stratford at the bow, for French of Paris was not hers to know. At table she had been well taught withal, and never from her lips let morsels fall, nor dipped her fingers deep in sauce, but ate with such, so much care the food upon her plate that never driblet fell upon her breast, and courtesy she had delight and zest. Her upper lip was always wiped so clean that in her cup was no iota seen of grease when she had drunk her draught of wine. Becomingly she reached, reached for meat to dine, and certainly delighting in good sport, she was right pleasant, amiable in short. And she and she was at pains to counterfeit the look of courtliness and stately manners took, and would be held worthy of reverence, but to say something of her moral sense, she was so charitable and piteous that she would weep if she but saw a mouse caught in a trap, though it were dead or bled. She had some little dogs, too, that she fed on roasted flesh or milk and fine wine bread. But sore she'd weep if one of them were dead, or if men smote it with a rod to smart, for pity ruled her and her tender heart. Right decorous her pleated wimple was, her nose was fine, her eyes were blue as glass, her mouth was small and therewith soft and red. But she certainly had a fair forehead. It was almost a full span broad, I own, for truth to tell, she was not undergrown. Neat was her cloak, as I was well aware, of coral small about her arm she'd bear, a string of beads, and gauded all with green, and therefrom hung a brooch of golden sheen. Upon there was written a crowned A, and under a more Vincent Omnia. Another little nun with her had she, who was her chaplain, and of priests, She'd three. All right, the prioress or the nun. Uh, this is kind of an interesting character. This is obviously a member of the clergy, you would think, because she's a nun, she's a sister. Um, but she goes by the name Madam, and Chaucer does a spends a lot of time talking about her manners, like how she eats without you know making a mess, and how she can speak French. And she has very good table manners. Um, and then there's a couple of clues at the end. She's wearing jewelry, which, you know, I guess is okay for a nun. I guess what they can wear a rosary, but she's not wearing a rosary. She's wearing beads that are uh, of, of jewel. Of, they're basically jewelry. And the A that 
she wears on her brooch stands for Amor Vincent Omnia. Now, we know that Amor is love, but it's not the kind of love that a nun should be worried about. None should be worried about agape or godly love, and she's more involved with romantic love. Um, I think she's probably got a backstory that we can maybe figure out. Um, you know, when you're a woman back in the Middle Ages, you don't have a lot of opportunities. You can either marry or be a farmer or be a prostitute or be a nun. Um, I think she was raised in a good family and was probably intended to marry into another wealthy family. And who knows, maybe the guy went overseas to battle the French or something and got killed. And so she decided not to marry. So she did the only other thing that she could, she could do, which was join a nunnery. It doesn't mean that she was going to, you know, uh, take a vow of poverty because she likes to eat and she likes to pet her little dogs and she likes to wear jewelry. So she's a nun, but she's not the most religious nun. She's not going around helping the poor and the sick. She's a nun by title because, you know, she didn't want to marry some other guy. Uh, she does not tell a story, but she does travel with another nun and three priests. One of the priests is going to tell one of the better stories in the Canterbury Tales. Uh, why they don't get described here, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe Chaucer was tired of describing the nun and, and well, I don't know. We don't really know why he did what he did. Let's go back to the chart. Okay, the prioress. I'm going to call her the prioress, even though she is a nun. But there's another nun, and I don't want to get confused. So she's like the head of the order. Um, she was raised wealthy. Yeah, she's a nun, but she doesn't really do nun things like we're used to seeing them do. She doesn't teach school children or, or treat the sick or anything. I think we're at 23 minutes, so we'll make another video, and I'll share it with you later. As for right now, uh, I'm going to stop. Uh, you can keep reading if you like, or you can wait for me. It's your choice. But uh, I'll talk to you later. Bye.